So we're starting with uh, this beautiful graffiti that was on the wall, um, just one bridge up from the Vatican, the wall uh, on the Tiber River. And I would see this uh, on my evening walks. And I got pictures of it during the day, but I had to go back and get it at night under the streetlights. <clears throat> and I thought I'd start tonight with um, the oldest um, lettering I'm going to show you tonight. And this is on uh, Ponte Fabricio uh, to the Isola Teberina. And the bridge was built in 62 BC. And there's no indication that the lettering was not done at the time. Um, and it was built of tuff and pepperino, whatever that is, and faced with travertine marble. Uh, so the, uh, the inscription is on both sides of the bridge, um, and really lovely. I, uh, I saw this on my first trip to Rome. Um, it's on uh, five itineraries. Do you know the book, Five Itineraries of Inscriptions? Uh, essential to go to Rome with that. There's walking tours, five different walking tours. Uh, that will take you by inscriptions and they're all listed in their his historical stuff. And on the island, the, the night that we went on this last trip to the island, um, it's now the home of a film festival. So this is um, this sculpture of lettering. Can anybody read this? Life is a movie is all it says. And it's not the greatest lettering in the world, but it's a nice try, right? I also had the best cheeseburger I've had in all of Europe on this island that night. I mean, I'm really, seriously, I, I want to go back for more pictures, but I'm going to get one of those burgers, too. <clears throat> so this is kind of the mascot of the, uh, of the issue, the last issue, and of the show tonight. Um, <clears throat> this letter was, um, well, I'll show you the whole inscription here. The, uh, this is the dedication to the Temple of the Genius of Augusta. Uh, and it was done uh, 7 to 2 BC. Uh, did I tell you the bridge was 62 BC? That, that makes that the oldest, okay. Uh, so uh, sometimes when they give that big of a range, I'm not sure if it means that they're just guessing that it was during that time or that it took five years for the thing to happen. Uh, but uh, what this says is uh, Mamiya, daughter of Publius, um, she was a public priestess to the genius, uh, no, wait, I'm sorry, she was a public priestess to the genius of Augusta on her own land at her own ex and at her own expense. So this is in the Archaeological Museum in Naples, which is so rich. Um, you want to hear a sad story? Dean Rubino and David Brooks went to Italy to see everything, and they went to this museum that day, and the epigraphic section was closed. <clears throat> I mean, tonight when I came downstairs, there was a, a red rope across keeping me from using the bathroom on this floor. So I had to go up to the zoo, you know? And um, I wanted to jump over that thing. And, <clears throat> and so David said he almost had to restrain Dean from uh, going over the rope and seeing those things. But I sent her all the pictures. Anyway, everything that's, not everything, but most of the stuff that is in the Naples Museum is from Pompeii. So all the stuff we're looking at here uh, is from Pompeii, and this was, um, a, you know, a, a temple in Pompeii. So you can see here that the uh, the letters themselves, when you when you stand back from them, even that beautiful S, which is on the second row, has a flatness to it. And you know what it reminds me of is the S in centaur. You ever notice the E in centaur, perfection, but the S has that flat spot at the bottom and the, the flat spot here. This reminds me of that. But then when you get up close to it, um, just unbelievable, and the serifs are so expressive. So this is <clears throat> 2 BC uh, at its latest, and uh, these serifs are just amazing in all of these letters. So this is you know more than 100 years before uh, the Trajan Column. And also on that same wall, this is uh, the eulogy of Romulus and the eulogy of Aeneas. Um, <clears throat> and they say this one, 7 BC to 2 AD, the estimate of time, I guess, marble, also from, the, uh, from Pompeii, the Forum in Pompeii. And I just love the, I love that, those caps that straddle uh, rustic and uh, a condensed Roman. And these are beautiful that way. 
Also in the museum in, in Naples, uh, this is a fragment of painted plaster from the Flavian age, Flavian age, uh, 69 to 96 AD. But, you know, this is a painted wall in um, Pompeii, so I'm guessing that it's pretty close to 79 AD. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the uh, inscriptions and lettering, public lettering that you would see um, has abbreviations galore. So that top line uh, actually says, vote for Trebius, an honest man for Edile. So here's the guy's name, here's the, um, the post he's running for, and these three letters say he's an honest man, apparently. <laughs> and the one on the bottom, also a campaign sign, uh, says, vote for Marcus Serenius Vatia for Edile, uh, who is worthy of public office. And then uh, Iernus, Irenus uh, is the last thing we're seeing, uh, the guy's name, and that means that he recommends him. Uh, so both of these, uh, beautifully painted on the wall, so quick, um, but in that, in a nice rustic. So we're gonna jump from there to uh, Lyon, which was uh, in Roman times called uh, Lugdunum. And this is the Claudian table, which is the, the, main, um, the main attraction in the uh, Roman Gallo Museum in Lyon. And uh, I don't want to sound like a travel agent, but Lyon is a fantastic place for all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and inscriptions and lettering is not the least of it. Um, besides the food and fantastic location, there's a brand new museum at the confluence of the rivers right at the point of the, the bottom of Lyon. Uh, there's this beautiful new museum that is indescribable, really, uh, plus the Roman Gallo Museum. So uh, the Claudian table is a speech um, <clears throat> that Claudius, uh, let's see, Claudius was born in Lyon in 10 BC, one of two emperors that, that came from Lyon, and this speech that he gave was um, it to, in the Senate in the support of Gallic leaders who were asking for the same rights as Roman citizens, and it's presumed that it was successful because the speech has been enshrined this way. So this was carved in wax and cast in bronze, and then touched up with a chisel. So the fantastic thing about it is that the letters feel kind of silver, but it's really just the way it's catching the light, that it's mostly cast, but if they wanted to, they would go back in and touch these things up uh, with the, a chisel afterwards. Isn't it cool? And it's big, you know, the, in fact, half of it's missing. Let's go back to the, um, I don't know if this is half of it, but the top part is missing. Uh, so this is about six feet tall, I'd say, something like that. Yeah. When you're looking at it, can you see where the text, where they went back in? Can you discern? Uh, well, they were, you know, the letters were so small that I, um, I didn't, you know, I, I read about that after I'd taken a picture of the, uh, you know, the, the thing on the wall that tells you what's going on. Um, so I couldn't see. Here's, here's a close-up, and I'm sorry this picture is out of focus, but I do love the, the dancing of that R and the tall I. Uh, plus those serifs. Remember those serifs, because we're going to see them again in a significant spot. So, Lyon, <clears throat> the Rome Gallo Museum is at the top of the hill where there's uh, the ruins of the Roman, uh, Roman life from that time. From 2,000 years ago, there was a forum up at the top of the uh, hill. In fact, Wikipedia says there was a Trajan forum, but I think that's a mistake. But it, there was a Roman forum uh, at the top of the hill, and they've since built a cathedral there. And right down the hill from that is the, the Roman Gallo Museum, and they have two Roman theaters left and ruins of an amphitheater, and they still use the theaters for productions now, plays and movies. One of them is called uh, Odeon, <laughs> Odeon in Lyon. Um, and so you take a funicular to get up to the top of that, and I, I got this fantastic picture. We got on the funicular first, and we were sitting down, and then this little family moved in, and were ready for their unwitting portrait. But look at the, look at the mouth and the noses of all these three kids. And uh, they must have their father's face, because that's their mother. And this is the little brother. And they didn't even know it. I just did this you know, from my, from my lap and caught this magic picture. It was really... 
So you get up to the top of the hill, and here is this cathedral. It's the Notre Dame de Fourvière, which means, let me see, I've got that written down here someplace. Um, it's an inversion of Vu Forum, or Forum Vetus, which is old forum or market. So they've named the church on the fact that it was in the location of the forum. And it's this magnificent place full of these murals that are all mosaic with gold tiles. And they're, they go on forever. Um, the, the, um, this mosaic here on the right is the, says in the Roman numerals, uh, 19, um, I'm sorry, uh, 1852, but all the dates that I found when I researched this say it's 1872, so I think they left out a couple of X's. Um, but that one was when it was conceived and built between 1872 and, and 1885, 1884. Um, and these um, mosaic murals were done right at the turn of the century. So um, this, uh, I got a little bit of um, translation help from Dean Rubino for this. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, it says, at the end of this mortal's life work, the distinguished painter finds purpose in himself. And I think it, these letter forms are a function of the, you know, the mosaic process, that there, there isn't much at all thick and thin. So it's uh, really nearly a monoline Roman. Uh, and you'll see that throughout the lettering uh, that I'm going to show you from this mural. These are signatures. Um, so one section of the murals were finished in, um, <clears throat> uh, wait, 1890. Is that what that says? It, it has four C's instead of, uh, so it started then, and this was designed by Charles Lumiere, and the mosaic artist was uh, Gilbert and Martin. And then later, there's one here that says it was finished in uh, 1915. So, uh, 1900, okay. Uh, there's a five, uh, there's a V on the end of this. I don't know if you can see it. But this is the same inscription or the same mosaic taken from different angles. So you can see how luminous these tiles are. So this, on the, the side here, that is the same one. Uh, and at this point, Rennie Martin was, Rene Martin was doing the mosaic by himself and Lemire had gotten himself a partner. This is uh, George Decote, or however you say it. I, I'm, I should have apologized in advance for all the mispronunciations I'm going to do tonight. This is a ceiling. All this is mosaic. It's incredible. Um, I took these pictures and didn't notice whether or not this was cast in metal or carved out of wood. But there were two of these over the exits. There was one to St. Lucas and one to St. Mark. So the inset here is Mark uh, from the the same kind of thing down the way, and you can still see mosaics like crazy behind it. And the lettering uh, runs across the bottom of all of this. Uh, so again, you see this uh, <clears throat> nearly monoline Roman. Uh, they did get the serifs in, though, uh, done in mosaic. Really gorgeous. And this is right up the hill, I mean, right, right up the hill from the Roman Gallo Museum, uh, which is full of classic uh, inscriptions, as well as lots and lots of um, what Dean calls everyday, not so polished writing and carving, which is what captivates. So this is a um, um, a, a small um, dedication to the three mother goddesses from 201 AD. Uh, it's formally embedded in the uh, Leon's Ene Church and it's dedicated to the Matres uh, Augusti by Felgo, and really interesting character here is this PH ligature. Uh, and the, but the really, the beautiful letter is this R that reminds me of Woody Wed Woodpecker for some reason. <laughs> really beautiful dancing letter, and still has the, the, the red paint in it, um, or it was repainted, you know, who knows. So I, I feel, felt like I had to throw in a couple of uh, pretty straightforward Romans for you, in, uh, and the museum is full of that. Uh, look how the wide stance on this N, that's the sort of standout letter. And I noticed that lots and lots of the inscriptions in the uh, museum had S's that leaned forward a little bit. And uh, plus there's a wide kick on the R, we'll see that a lot. So that was... Uh, 
Oh, that was one piece. And then uh, this one <clears throat> is a four-piece inscription, uh, and here's a detail of that. And uh, the lettering, I always love the lettering, of course, but seeing the ravages of time on things is another big part of this for me. So I, I love the, the rivers of uh, cracks that are going through this one. So this is one of, the, one of the theaters that you can see from a window. This picture was taken from a window in the museum. The museum is built into the hillside as it starts to run down towards this. And the first time I went, this is uh, my third trip to Lyon. Uh, the first time I went, they wouldn't let me take pictures in the museum, but they have this big quarry of inscriptions out here. And you can jump from stone to stone and take pictures you know, like this, and uh, really a lot of fun. These trailers weren't here the first time, and it seemed like there were more of these inscriptions. But uh, luckily, they relaxed the photography uh, uh, restriction, and uh, it's, boy, it's still really worth going. The first time I went, I wasn't even planning on going to Lyon. I, I stopped in Belgium, and Christophel Bodens, um, uh, I had gone to see a Jean-Claude Lambereau exhibit. He's a French stone carver, and... Um, stopped in Belgium first, and Christoffel said, well, if you're going, you have to go to Lyon because it's so full of, you know, the really, the gritty kind of uh, inscriptions. Uh, lots of inspiration for the Bowdens family uh, lettering comes from uh, a place like this. So this great, this is the epitaph of Appia Zoe from 259 AD, and uh, her husband had this done for her, and he thought her an exceptional woman, full of consideration for him, and the sweetest of souls, is what this says. And you can see that it's in two pieces, and these two pieces were you know, lost to history and discovered. One was discovered in 1832, and the other half was discovered in 1950, so more than 100 years later, and they put them together. Uh, and I can't decide whether this was the piece that was found first to give it exposure to the air and it lost all its pain, and this is the one they found second. Or if uh, you know, or the other way around. Who knows uh, what happens to those pieces over 118 years? Um, but they're together again, just like uh, Appia and her husband, with the gods. So uh, a close-up of the of the the still painted side. And this is a wall of the uh, the stuff that uh, captivates Dean and David. Um, each one of these following ones, and I'm going to go through them a little bit fast. I didn't get the information, but all of them are the, the exuberance of um, lettering amateurs. You know what amateur means, right? People who do things for the love of it. And really sassy letters everywhere. So this is just, you know, you're, you're doing this dance where it's, Take a picture, sidestep, take a picture, sidestep. Look at these, these R's. It's like um, the Moulin Rouge chorus line. And these ends, so these ends are kicking. You know, it's, it's funny, I, was, I showed this, to, I experimented on my students at Cabrillo with this last night, and um, I was telling them, we'd just done the Unchil uh, a week or two ago, and I was saying that, you know, early Unchils had the kick of the R sticking up uh, above the baseline frequently, and the ends as well, and so this one, the ends hit the baseline, but not the R's, and then this one, um, <clears throat> The R's do make it almost down to the bottom, but the N's are staying high on the right side. The dance uh, is beautiful even when it's awkward. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and so while we're talking about letters that are not as carefully made, um, <clears throat> whether on purpose or not, this is a, a marble inlay in the floor of the Vatican from 1966. And look at this. So this had to have been done on purpose to inlay the marble like that. And um, the thing that definitely appeals to my... Uh, the psychedelic side of me is these 
uh, these are the, the pillars, the bronze pillars of Bernini's Baldacchino, the canopy over the papal altar in the Vatican, um, 1623 to 34, and cast from bronze. Uh, this is another fact I got from Dean, cast from the bronze that was possibly liberated from the Pantheon. And a uh, different kind of pillars coming up here is this arm tattoo by uh, Lady Sarah, Sarah Laverne, Leverani. She's a tattoo artist in Bologna, and she was in my calligraphy class in Rome, just a couple blocks from the, um, from the Vatican also, and uh, she sacrificed her arm to a friend of hers and told him he could do whatever he wanted, and he freehanded this on her arm. Uh, while we're slumming here, I guess we, uh, uh, this is in Naples. Uh, one night while we were in Naples, we just got on the... Uh, the subway and picked a random exit and got off and we got off in a really dangerous neighborhood. Uh, and we ended up having dinner in an alleyway. This really, it turned out great. The food was fantastic. And it was just this little alley with tables sitting in the alley. Uh, but this was some graffiti on the way back, you know, hoping we could find that subway stop again. And we were walking down the middle of the street. I'm telling you, we were not walking near the alleys. So, um, on this trip, we started in Padua, um, and these are the doors to the Palazzo Zabora, um, a 19th century house, but you can see these were also uh, cast in bronze, and both of these gentlemen are holding scrolls filled with these tiny Roman caps. And it seemed to have been done in 1915, according to the door. Uh, the corners all had... Um, these icons, and different icons in each corner. Uh, Padua is a wonderful place. There's three fantastic museums uh, across the street from each other. And the first one we're gonna go to here is called Palazzo Zuckerman, which is applied in decorative arts. And so there's two floors that is the museum um, with the, uh, not so much paintings as uh, the decorative arts. And the top floor is the Botticin Museum, um, which is totally devoted to this collection that a man named uh, Nicola Botticin donated to um, the city of Padua in 1865, and they had this uh, museum. So coins were a big part of it. So the orange coins are uh, from the classical period, first century, and the ones on the black background are 20th century coins. And I was just, there were so many coins that I was just picking ones out and then I'd photograph the descriptive panel next to it and then uh, went on so that I could piece it together later. And when I got home, I realized that I had taken a picture of a Trajan coin, an actual Trajan coin from, uh, you know, from the first century in this great a shape. Online, there isn't a picture of a coin, one of these coins, anywhere near the quality of this coin. So I, uh, when I got back from uh, the trip to Italy, I was teaching in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I, and I showed some of these pictures, and I said, so I finally got this, I finally got this Trajan coin, and somebody in the class says, wow, what did that cost? <laughs> um, and I said, you know, can you just imagine that um, all the temples that have crumbled into the sea, since, I'm going to show you something that they dug out of the river, a fantastic building they dug out of the river in Rome, um, and this coin made it 2,000 years, 1,900 years in this kind of condition. How does that even happen? Uh, life is so strange and wonderful. So these signs were actually done in the 1880s, uh, around the 1880s sometime, for the museum itself. So they were signs advertising the museum or identifying the museum, and now there are pieces in the museum. So there was a lot of this beautiful woodwork. So this is a uh, a sign that has, um, it is three-dimensional, but it's carved to look like you can see the shade, like the letters are coming out at you even though they're about this far off the, they're just, whoops, moved to the side a little bit. So that sits straight on and you can make out the, the shade on the, the left edge of each stroke, but it's a carved um, illusion. You know how many of those, those painted illustrations of, of letters like this? Um, or signs that look like this that are painted, and here they actually carved one of them. And there were cases around the, uh, this top floor of the museum that had uh, woodwork obviously by the same person or, um, or else it was the style of the day. Really beautiful stuff. 
Um, also in Naples, one of the most beautiful gold leaf signs I've seen in all of uh, um, Italy, and I look for such things, of course. This is a tobacco shop in a shopping mall. So um, the guy saw me taking pictures of it, and he actually knew about the sign. He said it was done in the 1970s, late 1970s. And he didn't know who it was because he had bought the, uh, the shop from somebody else. Um, but do you know the sign, you know, gold leaf process? The, the burnish outline, when you do a two-tone gold sign on glass, you apply gold with a water size, uh, just big chunks of gold covering the areas that you're gonna, uh, that you're gonna have the outline, and then you paint on the back. All of this is done on the inside of the glass. You paint on the back the stuff that you want to stay on the, the glass. So the outline is got special paint that stands up to washing, and it also dries really quickly. So you paint the outline on the back of the gold, and when it dries, you wash the window, and every place that the gold is not protected by the paint, it comes off. So it's black paint on the back of this gold that's holding it onto the window. Then, then you paint a clear varnish in the middle of it, and, and that's just like a glue. You wait for it to get tacky, and you press the gold into it. So you can use two, two different colors of gold, um, and the outline is a mirror, so when you walk down the street and you walk by a sign that has a, a burnish outline, that changes, you know, depending on what it's reflecting. Whereas the middle, the matte center, keeps the light no matter what it does, and it keeps the true shape of the letter. So this also has a, a, a blended shade on it as well, um, just uh, one layer. My sign painting buddies in the letterheads uh, would have uh, what they call a, uh, a double split uh, blended shade. <clears throat> but this is not split, but it is blended. How it goes from the, the darker green to the lighter green. On this maroon background, so cool with these, uh, you know, deco-ish letters. Really nice. So we'll jump back in time then. This is 1326. Uh, <clears throat> back to Padua again. Uh, this is an inscription from the Church of San Lorenzo uh, in Padova um, with these Lombardic caps and eccentric uh, ligatures and characters that I have no idea what they are. What the heck is that? Does anybody read this? I didn't think so. So here's another one from the same museum, and this one is even more wacky. Uh, look how lightweight the thin lines are and how heavy these are, plus the, the great spurs that the swelling strokes have, the R's, the M's, the N's. Oh, and this one is um, 1422, a funerary inscription for a guy named uh, Jacopo Dal Santo, and this is from the Church of San Francesco. Also from uh, Padova is the, uh, a floor mosaic from mid fourth century, and it's a prayer for the room. And I've only got two things from Venice. This is from a couple years ago. Uh, Venice is a, a different animal than uh, the rest of Europe, it seems. It, uh, it, it doesn't go back as far. So it, uh, it, the graphics around there have a real different feel. I can't even tell if this says uh, C-A or L-A, Tintoretto. Does it make more sense to say La? La. Ka? What does that mean? Ah, okay. Uh -huh. While I was in Venice, though, the last time I was in Venice, I got taken to um, a gold leaf shop, a place where they're making gold leaf, and it was um, Titian's old studio. And they, it's now a gold leaf making shop. And I bought some fast, fantastic hand beaten gold that was done right in his studio. And then this gorgeous carved sign on a church. Also appeals to my psychedelic side, if Grendel was telling the truth. <laughs> so <clears throat> this, one, this is a, a long story here. This is the thing that they found in the river. This is buried under 12 feet of silt in the river. Uh, and this is the, um, oh, you know what I didn't bring? It's the notes for this. Shoot. Okay, I'm going to have to try and remember this. This is the, um, the era pakis. Uh, 
which is the uh, temple to um, Pax, the, the goddess of peace. And it was done in, oh man, I had all the facts. I knew I forgot something. Um, <clears throat> what's that? Augustus, Augustus yes. Uh, it, it was to celebrate him coming back from uh, Hispania and Gaul. He was gone for three years. And um, there isn't much lettering, but the, uh, God, the carving is just exquisite. Um, and this was built on the river plain, and over the centuries, it was completely covered. And they discovered, they discovered this in, got it, uh, this was another one where they found pieces in the 1500s, then they found them again in the 1800s, and they, uh, there were reasons that they couldn't excavate it for, because of existing buildings. And they decided to finally go for it in 1903 and reconstructed it, um, a lot of planning up to that time, uh, reconstructed it for a museum across the street from uh, Augustus's mausoleum um, by the Mussolini government. And, um, um, well, what was the architect's name? Montepurgo or something like that? I, ah, I wish I had those notes. Anyway, um, <clears throat> they started to build a museum to house this uh, as uh, a tribute to Augustus. And the, the next thing that they did was, when Augustus died, he had written a big long, uh, his last will and testament, and um, the res gestae, his, um, the deeds, uh, how, did, how do you say it, Dean? Uh, his, uh, yeah, the matter of things. It, it was just, he described all his, uh, his professional life. Um, and it's a very long um, uh, treatise, and they were cast into plates, in bronze plates that they put on the doors of his mausoleum, and then they sent it out to the provinces to do the same thing, uh, that they were gonna dedicate these buildings and with his words, all over the Roman Empire. The Roman plates disappeared, and so the only reason, the only way we know the complete text of his, um, you know, his famous words were these three different temples in uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, so this is from Ankara, and uh, they were able to piece together the full thing. They had three different versions of it, or three different sections of it, in these uh, carved on the walls in Turkey. Um, <clears throat> and this is also part of the 1938 restoration, that they cast the letters in bronze, and then did a rough carving into the stone, into the marble, and inserted the letters in there. So all of these letters were carved in the stone and then the cast letters were put inside. So here's pictures of them doing this in 1938. Um, designed also by this, uh, this architect whose name I could tell you if I brought that piece of paper with me. Um, so really kind of rough. I, you know, I, I thought, wow, could there be this many stone carvers in Rome in 1938, but the, the carving didn't have to be that exact because the bronze letters were gonna take care of most of that. So um, the thing about it is that there were 15,115 letters. So this is, um, this is my friend Robin modeling scale for us, and it goes on and on, 15,000 letters hand carved in, 19, in 1938, and then the war came along, so this museum did not get completed, and all that's left from the 1938 version of the museum is this wall, that's, that's it. And this is directly across the street. I mean, if she turned around, she'd be looking at um, Augustus's mausoleum, which is now under construction. Um, but, um, so this is Via Repetta. So if, if she turned to her right and looked down the street, she'd see the, the Popolo, uh, um, what's the word I want? The column, um, yeah, uh, blocks and blocks down the way, on, on the way up to uh, the gardens. <clears throat> so also in Rome, this, this church that I found this in is famous for being the home to the Caravaggio paintings of St. Matthew, uh, which was one of his first major um, commissions. And uh, we, you know, we were told to go there for the Caravaggio paintings, and then I got caught by this fantastic carving. All these letters are raised, you know. So let's say they're 
three-eighths of an inch off the marble. So that means that this guy had to carve down to the letters, past the letters, smooth out the letters, I mean the, the background, and leave those things raised without the chisel catching those letters and knocking something off. And look how many, you know, there's, this is, I've never carved marble, but this looks like a big task to me, a, a big careful task. It was done by a man named uh, Des Ver Vergnes, <laughs> would you say this uh, in Italian? D-E-S-V-E-R-G-N-E-S. -E -E Can you see that? Oh, it looks better up on the screen than here. And I think that's a C-H in the front, so uh, he could have been Charles, uh, or it could just be some uh, C-B, it could be some Italian thing I don't understand. But this is from 1900. Also in the same church was something that was a little bit simpler, but still the same thing. The letters were raised about it. Uh, a half of an inch, so they had to carve down to that layer and then go past that layer and smooth it all out. Really pretty amazing. And you can see from this shot here that this vein of the marble, this is one piece of marble. Incredible. <clears throat> now, of course, when you go to Rome, the Archaeological Museum uh, in Rome, it's directly across the street from the train station. You can just walk out the front door of the train station and go directly across the street, and you'll go in the front door of the, the museum. You can't miss the um, <clears throat> Muse uh, Museo Nazionale Romano. Um, and full of inscriptions. Uh, this, is, this cute little urn was, uh, uh, let's see, where are we? Um, urn for the ashes of uh, Celia Epire. Uh, she was a um, golden robe merchant. And then her husband is the, the name on the bottom of the urn in a completely different style. So we kind of have a Herculaneum, uh, you know, I don't want to say inspired by Herculaneum. Let's say a Herculaneum was inspired by this. Uh, Frutiger's typeface and then more classic uh, caps on the bottom. So this was first century AD was, was all they would say about uh, the date on this. And here's a slab placed by Ulpia Priscilla for her husband, Aphidus, who was um, an imperial freedman whose duty was to compile the guest list for the emperor. And his title was Invitator. Um, but, I, you know, so just the other day, you know, when uh, they were mentioning Pat Blair in the, the White House calligrapher, so I, I was imagining maybe he's writing the 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 invites, you know, doing the invitations and sending them out. So this, her husband was a freed man uh, who uh, became the calligrapher for the emperor. And it has a patera, which just means bowl, with a downflow of holes. I don't know why they would need this, um, but uh, for this uh, funerary slab. And this is the lid for a slave's slave. The, the slave was so important to whoever his master was, that they gave him his own slave. And he liked him enough to make this urn. This is the top of the urn. It also has a hole in it. So, um, um, you know, perhaps you use it like a salt shaker. Uh, I don't know. But the letters are great. The letters are really great. Okay, this is my favorite thing in the... Uh, I Really, I think this is my favorite thing that I saw in the... Uh, at least for this part of the slideshow. Um, <clears throat> this is a brick stamp um, from 146 AD. And again, Dean helped me a lot with the uh, translation of this. And it's from the farm estate manor of something called Four Waters. That could be the name of this farm. And then the family name, which is Aeneas. The inner circle has a woman's name, Faustina, and the potter's name, Sexti Apri Silvini. Every word and name in this is abbreviated, every single one. Um, and the picture is a bust of Mercury in his traveling cap called a pet petasati, with a caduceus behind him and his purse in front of him. Uh, so all this uh, help, I, I need to say, uh, gratias tibi to Dean and David for helping me figure this out. But the thing I love about this, there were lots of these things that had this letter style, which is the ancestor of the Latin typeface, you know, with wedge serifs. And I asked Stephen to uh, uh, get out one of the uh, uh, type specimens uh, from the 
uh, letter form archive today, and it's in the case in the back, so you can see the modern day version of, it's always been one of my favorite kind of typefaces, the Latin family of type, and it definitely came right from this. So here's, this is one, that you can see that this is stamped in clay, so these these guys, this the Aeneas family was probably uh, clay brick makers, and they would stamp their work. Uh, although when I see this one, it really feels like this is carved out of stone, but if it was the stamp to press into the, uh, to make the impression in the brick, it would have had to have been backwards. So it, it must have been, and this one is painted, this one is not. And here's one more with that letter style in a square one. And these are all little things, like about this, uh, all first century uh, Rome. No, this is second century, I'm sorry, 146. Um, one of my favorite things about Roman lettering uh, that I've noticed since I went um, is I love strokes that don't have vertical serifs. So the E's, the F's, the T's, they're all open going this way. Vertical strokes have flat horizontal serifs, but there's no vertical serifs. And it's something that I just love about um, um, this, you know, from this time period of lettering. There's a, a tour of the Scavi beneath the Vatican that you can go. You know, the main attraction there is that they take you by uh, the mausoleum that they think held St. Peter's bones, but it's in a cemetery, and so it's full of these inscriptions and some of the most gorgeous letters in all of Rome, and there's lots of this, and they don't let you take pictures. So uh, um, next time, I'm, I'm going to ask somebody if I can take some pictures. Uh, but this one, uh, can you see the, the scratch guidelines? So whether or not it was painted or carved, they would scratch guidelines in it. You know, it's like somebody should have invented a pencil for these people. Uh, so this one is from a, um, a decree of the Jewish community in Ostia, uh, early first century. And again, the really wide R's, we see a lot of that. Uh, there's a hint of vertical serifs over here on this E, so it, it wasn't every place, uh, but it was common to see those things being open. This is a long poem uh, from sec second century AD dedicated by a patron and perhaps lover of a freedwoman, Alia Podesta. So her name is across the top. Uh, here it says Podesta, but uh, the translation, uh, they changed it to a D for some reason. Uh, the opening, dismanib, or is, is short for um, dismanibus sacrum, which is to the mains or the departed spirits or ghosts or shades. So frequently, you know, back on this last one here, this DM stands for this uh, dismanibus uh, sacrum. Here it's, they've shortened it to dismanib. And details, here her name is done in, you know, these flying uh, horizontal strokes, uh, which I'm just so in love with. Um, and then the text itself is uh, slightly rustic, slightly square caps, all exuberance. And this gorgeous thing, I mean, you know, this is my favorite piece that I saw on this uh, trip. Um, not that other crummy thing before. Um, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is a marble piece from uh, uh, Naples. Um, and... It's um, three munip municipal decrees honoring Tetia Casta, who is a priestess for a feminine cult, uh, possibly uh, Demeters, the goddess of harvest and agriculture. And you can see that it's done in Greek, and it's been damaged over the years, uh, where the, the letters exposed the, the stone. And you can just imagine the structure of the stone being in like horizontal flakes. So if it got any damage, these things would pop off with just slim horizontal things and give us these fantastic new letters. And look at these two A's. They, they got distressed in the same way. The middle of this N is gone. And this E is sort of sliding away. And these two T's bookending each other. It's, uh, you know, again, the ravages of time. It's, it's a wonderful thing uh, what it's doing to letters that were beautiful in the first place and turning them into something that was not created by the hand of man. It's a, it's a, a lovely thing. So this is also from uh, Naples, and um, it's not from uh, Pompeii. This is from Pudioli, which is a modern-day uh, Posioli. Uh, and Pudioli comes from the Latin name Pudio to stink. Um, and it's built on a, a volcanic um, 
caldera. So there's the sulfur smell is all over the place. Um, St. Paul landed there and lasted a week and said, well, let's go to Rome, you know, because... Uh, and this is a uh, dedication to the Emperor Domitian. So it was done in uh, 93 or 94 AD, uh, just 20 years before the Trajan Column. And um, it was put up in, uh, by the Regio of the Vicus Vistorianus and Calpurnianus. So, you know, it's no surprise that it stank. But, um, <laughs> but the thing to notice here is that the, the lettering changes, it comes from the top. At the top, we've got classic Roman uh, lettering, very much like Trajan caps. And down at the bottom, look how stylized it got, where the, the bowl of the R turned into this perfect circle. So it reminds me of two things. Uh, one of the, my favorite things about um, Trajan style lettering is that center stroke coming out straight and not becoming part of the circle. So here's three pieces by Kadich where he points out, he calls this the juncture, one of the junctures, the, the place where that horizontal stroke hits the curve stroke. And these two pieces from, uh, also from Kadich emphasize that even stronger, that this is a straight horizontal stroke coming out from there. So if, and this is that top corner of the uh, Domitian piece, Domitian piece, I'm sorry. Um, and down below, I want to show you, this is Trajan, this is Stevens titling, and this is Origami by Carl Crossgrove, uh, John Stevens, Stevens titling. So you can see that uh, with um, Trajan, they stylized it, and they did round out that place. We're, we're used to seeing it being round in an R. John caught the, uh, you know, Caddish's juncture, and Carl Crossgrove, one of the main design features of this beautiful face origami is that the counter spaces in the round letters are rectangles. And that's really kind of what is causing the juncture here, but it really does echo the shape of these things. So, uh, boy, do I love uh, origami. If he would just make small caps, um, I would use it much more. And then, here, now we're going down to the lower part of that inscription where the stylized thing, and as soon as I saw this, I thought about this, this little wooden letter that I had gotten from a friend. It was broken. Um, I, you know, I, I fixed this in Photoshop, and then I thought, oh, you guys could, should see what it really looks like uh, since we're talking about the ravages of time, but the roundness of the bottom of this bowl. So you know, it's not like I'm exclusively a flat mid-stroke guy. It's a, um, I like letters you know, wherever uh, it moves you. So uh, both these R's, and let's go back for just a second. I want to show you the, the full piece, that very classic Roman caps at the top, and then we get down to the, um, the more stylized ones at the bottom. Isn't that cool? You gotta admit. Okay, so um, let's go back in time. Um, this is, we're going back to 1973 here. I, my teacher at Humboldt State was Reese Bullen. As uh, uh, Grendel mentioned, that part was true. And uh, in 2005, I, I took calligraphy in 1973 at Humboldt State. Uh, and in 2005, I was going to do a slideshow about uh, the ghosts of calligraphy. And I thought, well, I can make it personal. It doesn't have to be famous people. So I went and saw his son, who is a, a printer in Berkeley, David Bullen. And, um, to uh, do some research, to see what he had on his father. And we're going through a box of stuff, and I pull out this photograph. This is 2005, 30 years after my first calligraphy class, and it was like my second calligraphy lesson. I saw a picture of this thing. It was so beautiful that I remember the first day, Roman caps, we did straight stroke letters, E's, H's, A's, and V's. Second one was composite characters. So this is my second calligraphy lesson. Uh, it, it probably wasn't taken the day of my class, but it was that era. This is my classroom. Uh, really exciting thing. And of course, I heard about the Trajan column on the first day of um, my first calligraphy class. Um, and of course, you know, the, the famous Kadich theory is that the letters were painted on stone, then the, the carvers came along, and the shape of our letters came from the brush, not the chisel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here is uh, you know, an, another famous part of the origin of the serif, of course, is that Father Kadich was a sign painter in Chicago uh, before he entered the priesthood and started studying 
uh, paleontology. And um, so there's a chapter in Origin of the Seraph about this, but um, recently I took a picture of this watercolor study that uh, Kadich did. Paul Herrera had this, um, and where he's talking about, uh, he's always said that a, a Roman uh, letter painter in a toga could get a job in a Chicago sign shop in the 1920s. So he's making that comparison right here and saying that a Chicago sign painter could go back in time and get right on the crew that was uh, working on the, on the column and any place else. Uh, I'm lingering here a little bit to give you a chance to read this. Um, really pretty funny. And then Kadich loved to do what he called cant gyrations with, a, um, with the brush, um, <clears throat> meaning angle changes. Uh, so these exercises, here, i just never seen them in watercolors like this. This other one, there was another piece uh, with these watercolors where he had changed the color for each of the different strokes of the letter. And notice this, you know, that he's not polishing these letters. He's making the stroke be the simple stroke. And, uh, oh, before we get to that, I was going to show you his carving, that he was faithful to those letters in his carving sometimes. This is Uldrich Menhart in his book, Nauka Opismu, where he's showing us Kadich theory in two and a half inches. And not only is the brush influencing the shape of the letter, the silhouette of the letter, he's appearing to suggest that it's also influencing the shape of the terminal in the carving as well. So uh, this is um, a Kadich slate in Rick Cusick's living room. It's on one wall, and on this wall, there's a Kadich rubbing of the, Trajan, of the inscription on the Trajan column in his living room. The light was so bad, I couldn't get a good shot of it, um, I, and I decided not to show you the bad shots. But I did want, to, want you to see this letter. Look at the gorgeous carving that we have here that he's really showing the flow of the brush with the, uh, with the point, uh, the deep point of the carving coming in. Uh, really gorgeous. This really bad low light, so this is not the greatest one, but you can, you can see the carving here. And then uh, we have some uh, of his lithostone carvings from Reed College here as well. So this is all carved, and everything is painted except the ampersand is gilded. And one of the things, one of the points that he makes in Origin of the Seraph, and that we talked about a little bit in the, the article in the last alphabet, is that Kadich believed that incise carving should be very shallow. And these stones at Reed, you can see, are just breathtakingly shallow. I've carved wooden signs, wood, you know, incised carved letters in uh, wood, as well as I, I took a class from Paul Herrera and did slate once. And shallow is actually a little harder than deeper to keep it even to get through this. And these stones at Reed are fantastic. And Andrea, I, I searched all over for my pictures of the stones that are upstairs in the Harrison, uh, couldn't find those pictures. So I'm not showing those things, but that gives you an excuse to go upstairs and see the two Kadich stones that uh, are here in the library at the Harrison Collection. Uh, here's an upside down shot of the painted letter. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll come back to that. But in all of these cases, you can see just how shallow his carving is. Pretty amazing. And as a, uh, a contrast here, I want to show you somebody who does carve deeply. And this is Jean-Claude Lambereau. The first time I uh, came to Lyon, was I was really coming to see uh, Lambaro's show. He had a tiny little show in uh, Vauvic, uh, which is at the same latitude as Lyon. Uh, and I was coming to see that before Christoffel said, well, it's great you're coming to see Jean-Claude, who was one of his teachers, by the way. Uh, but you've got to go to Lyon to see the carvings there. So look how deep these are. And if you're not familiar with uh, Lambaro's stuff, um, well, I've got another slideshow about him if you want to see that. Um, and he did really fantastic uh, combo characters and ligatures, uh, very inventive. The letter forms were not that unusual. He would take these classic forms and make them his own. Uh, so his layout and his carving was so exciting. I'm sorry, this is the only piece of his that I'm going to show you, but it's just for contrast. This is a Kadich slate in David Bullen's living room uh, that obviously came from his father. Um, and here it's a handwriting called Petrarch, which is um, Kadich's um, humanistic uh, bookhand, uh, carved in slate. And you'll notice with all of Kadich's stuff, it's either gilded or painted. 
And here's those serifs again that we talked about uh, earlier um, in these the gilded caps. So look at the carving here, these, these great little rectangles that create X's in the uh, incision uh, and this sideways movement. And the last caddish thing I'll show you for now is another stone from, um, from Reed, the, in the library at Reed. Um, and I thought this was just uh, something that he was working on on paper. It looked like yellowed Bristol board or something like that. And then I noticed up in the top that he started to carve this. So this is a litho stone, and it says Reed written handwriting. Again, named Petrarch. Um, and um, so I think he was saying that he wrote this on the stone with uh, touche, I guess, uh, using a pen and not a brush, and started to carve, and some, something got in the way, he just decided not to carve this. So you have this great beginning of the carving and seeing his handwriting. So here's a picture of my teacher on the left, Reese Bullen and Father Kadich. This is 1973 in Eureka. Like two months after I picked up a calligraphy pen, um, Lenore Cady and Reese Bullen brought Father Kadich to Eureka for workshops. So um, I, so I signed up for a read writing workshop with Father Kadich. Is that a big surprise to you, Grendel? <laughs> um, and you know, most of it went right over my head, but I do have to tell you that uh, two things I remember. Uh, the first thing he said to us, because it was about read pens, was that uh, to the true calligrapher, speedball is a dirty word. <laughs> and, and then we, we carved read pens and uh, uh, he carved reed pens for us, and we wrote a little bit. It was just a morning class. It was set up that you could, there were four workshops over two days, and you could take all four, which would lead you to painting on stone and carving a little bit, but I could only afford it, you know, I was uh, a college student. So I just took the, the morning class and left. But the last thing he did was he painted on slate, gray slate with pink paint and a flat brush, and I had never seen anything so beautiful happen so fast. This you know, beautiful pink letters on slate, and then he washed them right off. I was like, whoa, what are you doing? He goes, well, you know, we'll do it again in the afternoon class. You know, he wanted to save the slate for that, but uh, it did make an impression even though uh, I wasn't ready. Anyway, I'd, all this is leading up to the fact that I've been hearing about the Trajan Column all my calligraphy life, and finally in 2001, I got a chance to go to, uh, to Rome, couldn't wait to see it, got there covered in scaffolding. And it also the rude awakening of finding out that they do not let you down into the forum. I had never, I had no idea. I thought I was gonna be strolling up and um, you know, getting a good look at these letters. So we went back in 2004, the scaffolding was still up. Went back in 2012, it was down, but of course you can't get down inside. And then on this last trip last summer, um, fate, all kinds of luck happened. This is what it looks like on an August afternoon uh, these days, and we did get down inside the forum uh, to see these things and get, uh, get some pictures. So here's uh, finally in all its glory, the Trajan inscription. We'll just go closer and closer. Uh, the, you know, if you've seen older pictures of it, uh, there were stains uh, all down the right side, and the scaffolding was up for the restoration of the column and especially uh, the base, um, and there has been acid rain, da da rain damage. A lot of the carvings on the column itself and on the building are uh, shadows of what they used to be. The lettering feels soft. I have to say the lettering does feel soft, but it, it was so beautiful to see it, and the marble up close was uh, a huge revelation. It was a, a fantastic thing to, to get up there. It was really one of the best days of my life. Um, not to be too nerdy about stuff, but um, <laughs> these the letters, of course, Kadich says that they were there, they were carved, everything was carved for permanence, but uh, it was also a vehicle to be painted. So this was the, um, it's theorized and it's probable that the entire thing was painted. Uh, so <clears throat> because of the uh, volcano in Pompeii, we can see some of these letters that still retain their paint inside. Almost always when you see pictures or you see anything painted, the letters are painted red uh, on the, the white surface. Sometimes it's, it's painted white. Uh, we're going to see, uh, we'll get to that painting part in a second. So this is the base, and then 
uh, it was explained to us that the, the inscription is on what's called the sixth block, or the sixth stone. So you can see here that the construction is that at the base, they run sideways. The next uh, one and two run this way, three and four run this way, five and six run this way, seven and eight run this way. So the sixth block is the full width of the column uh, in the front, and uh, the five is in the back. And this is, uh, I, I just took this right out of National Geographic. The uh, April 2015 has a big story on the column uh, and the history of the, the wars itself. <clears throat> they even go to Romania. Um, uh, you know, Trajan wiped out the civilization of the Dacians, wiped it out, uh, and took all their riches. There were gold mines and, you know, this fabulous new wealth built Trajan's Forum and the column, and the column is celebrating the two wars that they had in um, <clears throat> 102, uh, 101 and 102, and then 105 and 106. Then they came home with all this loot and built the column. So, um, so modern-day Romanians find the column a real valuable thing so they can see what their ancestors looked like, or how they dressed anyway, uh, because they're shown being slaughtered on the barber pole of the, the column going up. Um, so the, the inscription is not mentioned, barely mentioned, but you can see here that it's red letters on the white background, and all the rest of it is painted. This, this of course, is them uh, you know, colorizing their photographs for this and designing this. There's a big five-stretch pull-out poster of the Trajan column in it. So if you can track that down, it's kind of cool to have. Uh, the last thing here, notice there's no shadows on the, on the inscription. Um, our hostess picked the time of day that we, the light was the best for us to show up. The inscription is tilted out about a half inch so that it makes it a little bit easier to see from the, from the ground. And um, of course, it's famous that the top letters are taller than the bottom letters to make it feel like they're all the same size. Uh, that's one theory. The other one is that they... Um, uh, the top rows are more important uh, information than the bottom rows. So here's just a sense of scale. Uh, I also have another picture where uh, one I took of uh, some of the friends that were with us uh, that made it feel much smaller. So it really has to do with the angle of the camera. But uh, I was in awe at that point. And if you turn from where I was standing, if you turn around and um, look uh, to your right, if you're facing out, this is the uh, Vittorio Emanuel, the wedding cake, you know, the, at the bottom of Via del Corso. And I wanted to get a picture of it from the Trajan column rather than a picture of the Trajan column from Vittorio Emanuel, which is the way I always had to do it before. Uh, and it's much, it's more pretty this way, you know, with these trees in the way. So uh, down here in the corner, this is uh, one of my, uh, you know, participants in the, the workshops that I taught in, uh, in Italy, and she also set up the Rome workshop. Uh, this is Chiara Riva. So we're going to finish up with some um, lettering by these modern artists. And so here's uh, Chiara's work. Uh, she's really young, and she's only been doing calligraphy since 2012. And she really has um, a soul that sees beauty. We spent a lot of time together with a pointed brush. Um, this is uh, from last summer's, this is something she did in class it, uh, up in Abano in the north of uh, Italy um, where they have a re retreat. The Calligraphy Association, the Italian Calligraphy Association has a retreat in this uh, monastery every year uh, with different teachers. So uh, I taught there in 2015 and again this last time and Chiara was in the class. And we were looking at Roger X. Caffon's Mistral as a influence for brush lettering here. And she loved that, did terrific with that. Here's a recent one with, a, with these uh, beautiful little caps, as well as a, you know, more uh, italic caps for the background, but I love the, uh, the black caps here. And this is a detail, the one on the right is a detail of the next piece, her last piece that we're gonna see here so um, she seems to have been a calligrapher in a previous life. And next is uh, Giovanni Di Faccio. Uh, 
we hung out together in, uh, he teaches at Abano every year. He's one of the founders of the Italian Calligraphy Association. Uh, and he teaches there every year. The other teachers, um, they bring in uh, different folks every year, but he is there every year. And um, he's, uh, he's a stone carver, carver and a um, type designer, as well as one of Italy's preeminent calligraphers even though he now lives in Austria. I think his wife is Austrian. And he teaches calligraphy and type design at the New, Di New Design University in St. Polten, Austria. Um, and it's probably not an exaggeration to say that he's been, uh, that every Italian calligrapher in Italy today uh, has been his student one way or another. Um, and here's his uh, rustic. This is from a, uh, uh, instructional book that the um, association put out uh, four or five years ago, and he did several of the plates along with other members of the of the group. I love how clean this is, and here's his uncial. But he does modern work too, and here's some of his stone work besides the Mozart. But those other three pieces are carved. And this project, he calls it the Literae Project. It's a manuscript on parchment using a quill pen only and mineral and vegetable pigments prepared at home according to ancient recipes. So he's trying to be uh, you know, as uh, faithful to the old time scribe as possible. And it was a five year project. Uh, and I've got just six plates from the book. Each one is different, even though the layout is very similar. Um, each style is really different. I love this. Uh, this wild one on the left contrasted to the uh, Italian handwriting on the right. And here's his typeface, Rialto. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a sucker for uh, half bracketed letters, and these are really loudly half bracketed. You know, there's a bracket on the, the left on the bottom and um, on the right at the top. So it's, it's kind of a reverse Kadich flow. I'm oh, sorry, I should do it. You know, Kadich comes in from the from the left ends on the right, but he's starting on the, the right and ending on the left with his half bracket here. <clears throat> and one last uh, look at Giovanni. Giovanni's most famous student, and this should remind you of him a little bit, is uh, Luca Barcellona. And uh, Luca has published so much. He's got the, the beautiful book. He's all over the, the web. He's, uh, this is a busy guy. He really has uh, become successful. Uh, did you know he was a rapper first? He's part of a trio of rappers. And he came to calligraphy through graffiti. Uh, but Giovanni changed his life by introducing him to calligraphy. So now he does experimental, you know, he has the influence from both fields. Um, and. Uh, I thought I would show you something that you might not get to see. When I visited him in Milan in 2012, um, he let me go through his flat files. So I just took pictures of things he was goofing off on butcher paper with. So each one of these is uh, just cheap butcher paper with white and black paint, uh, all with a brush. And you can see that very influenced by uh, Giovanni, uh, and the cant gyrations that Kadich talked about, there's his brushes moving all over the place with this stuff. And there's also a little uh, linoleum cut book uh, of his work. Um, I think that's, oh, and then you can also get um, Luca Barcelona wallpaper. <laughs> this is really, there's a, um, a website, it's mentioned in the, in the journal, um, that you can order this piece of wallpaper and put it up on your, there's a, I think he's got three designs for them that you could order. And then um, finally, our last artist, uh, this is Elena Pelicoro. She's from Turin and she is a character. She's uh, classically trained as a um, trompe l'oeil artist, um, all kinds of practical painting stuff. So this carving is a painting. So all of this is illustration. She, there's lots of these ceilings where she paints, decor, you know, does decorative work on these ceilings. This is um, a painted bookcase and decorated furniture, uh, along with a, a, a decorative cap, you know, a painted 
Uh, this is a convex letter. It's coming out towards us, not going in. You can always tell if you're, if you're ever trying to figure that out, if the shadow is on the underside, it's coming out at you. If, it's, if the shadow is on the top side of the strokes, it's uh, supposed to be a, a con cut in uh, letter, concave. <clears throat> cut and embossed. She loves to emboss. So she loves wacky modern stuff as well as classical. This is all cut paper. Uh, <clears throat> Accordion fold book, just gray and red and white paper. This one has uh, primary colors only, but a similar feeling to those kind of letters. Scroll work, painted scroll work, another three-dimensional decorative letter, that H. And this one, when the first time I saw this, uh, this piece, it was hanging in front of a bookcase, so I thought she had cut it out of paper, but it turns out that it's just painted on acetate. But So when I asked her about that, she goes, oh, that gives me an idea. So I think we're going to see this one cut out soon. Uh, so traditional calligraphy uh, over here, you know, she's come to calligraphy a little bit late. A little bit later, she's been doing all these decorative arts for so long and painting letters. Uh, the calligraphy is kind of new. This is embossed and gilded, but She's dynamite with a pen also. So uh, this is pen work uh, from our class in Abano this last summer, and this is uh, embossed work. Here's a, a, a cut accordion alphabet. Cut on the left, embossed on the right, a, uh, a cut fish in the middle. So remember, with embossing, she's cutting all of these things out of heavy board. Uh, and then pressing the paper down into it. So all of it's cutting, uh, but paper is a lot easier to cut than the board for embossing. Intricate cutting here, cutting and folding to get these letters to pop out at you. So endlessly inventive, endlessly looking for, for stuff. This is a, a painted map, and the most beautiful letter that I saw on this trip um, of this section of the slideshow um, is this S. So a painted scroll, like circus scroll uh, lettering. I flipped over this one so loud that it's now hanging in my house. <laughs> it's only about this big. So I suppose um, <laughs> this is uh, this is from Giotto's uh, Scrivani Chapel, which is right across the street from Palazzo Zuckerman in, uh, in Padua. Padua, or Padova, I should say. Um, and so I hope uh, we haven't got steam coming out of your eyeballs, but I did want to leave you with one last thing. This is, uh, this is the way we closed uh, Dean's article in the journal, and this is a funerary slab of Maxima dated 525 A.D., with a cross at the beginning and a Christian palm at the end. This is Dean's words. There is much to admire. The cues that look like backward nines uh, in uh, requisite and K. Okay, where's requisite? Uh, on the top, yeah. That's a, that's a cue. Um, <clears throat> the small vowels, the careful bars, individual abbreviations, the way lists was fit in. Where's lists fitting in there, uh, Dean? Second to the bottom, yeah, right there. And the overall liveliness, the translation, here rest in peace, maid servant of Christ, Maxima, who lived 25 years or so. She lived with her husband for seven years and six months. She was friendly, faithful, good to everyone, and prudent. So uh, as a closing thought tonight, we said, may we all be friendly, faithful, good to everyone, and lively overall. The prudence is up to you. <laughs> <laughs>